Hello, my dear dear YouTube viewers. Myself, Dr. Palani Raman from Professor YK Ambedkar and team. Today's topic for discussion is CBC indications and interpretation. As we all know, CBC is the most common test done in day-to-day -day practice and without proper indications and with improper interpretation. CBC is nothing but a complete blood count with incomplete interpretation. What do you mean by incomplete interpretation? Often a physician sees the CBC strip and reads only the WBC parameters like PCDC and ignoring the what is happening in the other cell lines. For example, in a febrile child of 3 days duration or 4 days duration, when you come across a CBC strip, and if there is a leukopenia, when you look at the other cell lines showing thrombocytopenia and with a high hematocrit, it clinches the diagnosis on spot that it is a case of dengue. So that is the importance of looking at all the three cell lines when you are interpreting properly. Also, before going to the topic proper, one should be aware of the pre-analytical errors in the form of sampling error and machine related error which can alter the values resulting in interpretation issues. Also, one should know the reference values across different age groups. Why? Because the normal reference values changes across the, all the age groups starting from the neonatal period to the childhood, toddler, as well as adolescent and adult. For example, in a newborn, hemoglobin less than 12 gram is considered as an anemia. In a newborn, MCV is 1 not 8, which is an abnormal if it is occurs in an older age group. So, one should be aware of the normal reference values across the different age groups before interpretation. Now, coming to the indications, the most common indication is in the field of infectious diseases, particularly a febrile patient. In a febrile child, it is quite useful. In short duration fevers, particularly in fever without focus or localizing signs, as well as in case of prolonged fever, that is PUO, serial CBCs are quite useful. Before going to the interpretation in a febrile child, one should know the cutoff values. With respect to total count, anything between 5 to 15,000 is normal, less than 5,000 is leukopenia, above 15,000 is leukocytosis. Whereas in adults, this value is from actually 4 to 11,000 instead of 5 to 15,000. With respect to other cell lines, for all practical purposes, anything less than 10 gram is considered as anemia and, and platelet count less than 1 lakh is considered as a thrombocytopenia. So apart from this, timing of the CBC in a febrile child is important. Any CBC done within 24 hours of onset of the fever will show a neutrophilia which can be a stress neutrophilia. As well as this stress neutrophilia also can occur in other situations like a baby with incessant cry, with a recurrent vomiting or a recurrent convulsion or acute severe asthma, there can be stress neutrophilia. The marginated neutrophils will come to the circulation and produce stress neutrophilia. This one should be aware of. So, ideally, a CBC should be done after 3 days or after 2 days, 48 to 72 hours in a febrile child, particularly when there are no clues by history and clinical examination. So, there can arise three types of scenarios. One scenario is febrile child with neutrophilic leukocytosis, the other is febrile child with lymphocytic leukocytosis. The third child is febrile child with leukopenia. Let us see how to interpret the situations one by one. Now coming to the first scenario. Here is a child, small baby with a fever of more than three days. You are doing the CBC as there is no clinical clues and CBC shows total count more than 15,000 with the predominance of neutrophils. It indicates that mostly there is some hidden bacterial infection in the form of UTI or pneumonia. You should go for a specific investigation like urine as well as 
chest x-ray to rule out hidden pneumonia and hidden UTI. In the same way, skeletal infections also can be there. You should thoroughly examine the skeletal aspects. By day 5 of fever, 5 to 6 of fever, when there is a neutrophily leukocytosis, after ruling out pneumonia and UTI, one should always think about hidden abscess somewhere. Particularly, hidden retroperitoneal abscess is a very important thing. And after ruling out all the serious bacterial infections, one should think beyond infections in the form of Kawasaki disease or SOJRA, particularly when there is neutrophilic leukocytosis and thrombocytosis by day 5 and day 6. Now, here is a catch. Even an invasive adenoviral infection also can cause neutrophilic leukocytosis. So, in short, what does this mean? Neutrophilic leukocytosis does not mean always a serious bacterial infection. It can occur in simple condition like stress neutrophilia or in bacteria, viral infection like adenoviral infection or a serious bacterial infection or beyond infection like Kawasaki disease or SOJRA. So, this is the message one should be uh, carry home. Now, coming to the second scenario. Now, here is this child, 3 year old child with a fever of 3 to 5 days duration. Clinically, no clues. There is lymphocytic leukocytosis. Total count is more than 15,000. And lymphocytes are more than predominant. And with other cell lines are normal. So, the interpretation should be a common viral infection with reactive lymphocytosis, particularly viral infections like echovirus, Coxsackie virus can produce this scenario, as well as pertussis also can produce this scenario. But one should be aware when there is a lymphocytic leukocytosis, but when other cell lines are affected, when there is associated anemia or thrombocytopenia, it is a red flag and your antenna should be high particularly to look at the smear for abnormal cells like atypical cells to rule out infectious mononucleosis or atypical cells in the form of blast cells. So, in short, whenever there is lymphocytic leukocytosis in a febrile child, when other cell lines are abnormal, it is a red flag. Okay. Now, coming to the third scenario. Now, here is a six-year-old child, school-going child coming with a fever of four to five days duration. And when you look up on the CBC, there is leukopenia. That is, the total count is less than 5000. It can be a lymphopenic leukopenia or a neutrophilic leukopenia. When there is a leukopenia with other cell lines are normal, again it indicates it is a common viral infection. Like a human herpes virus infection can produce this picture. But if there is a leukopenia with a thrombocytopenia, depending upon the timing, for example, if the leukopenia and thrombocytopenia occur early in the illness by day 3, day 4 of fever, it indicates you are dealing with a, mostly a case of dengue or malaria. If it occurs by the end of the week, that you may be dealing with a case of typhoid or typhus. So, and in the same way, a leukopenia with eosinophilia, that is eosinophil count has 0%, indicates mostly you are dealing with a case of typhoid. This is the way the message is, all the tropical infections like dengue, malaria, typhoid, typhus, everything will produce us leukopenia with thrombocytopenia. The only exception is leptospirosis. It will produce neutrophilia with thrombocytopenia. Okay, so far we have known how to interpret the CBC in a febrile child. Now let us see the second indication where it is useful. And particularly, it is very useful. When a patient presents with a primary hematological problem like a pallor or bleeding. In the case of pallor, when the hemoglobin is less than 10 grams, you should look about particularly what are the red blood cell indices. It gives a phenomenal value. When there is a microcytic hypochromic anemia with a high RDW, it indicates you are dealing with a iron deficiency anemia unless proved otherwise. When there is Macrocytic anemia with a high RDW, it indicates mostly you are dealing with the case of folic acid or a B12 deficiency anemia. But when there is a microcytic or a macrocytic anemia with a normal RDW, you should be able to refer to the hematologist. Why? Because they can be due to different sinister causes. For example, 
when there is a microcytic hypochromic anemia with a normal RDW, it indicates thaltrate or a sideroblastic anemia or a lead poisoning. Whereas a micro, macrocytic anemia with a normal RDW, it can be as sinister as aplastic anemia or a hypothyroidism or liver diseases. So, these indices are very, very important. What about normocytic anemia? Whenever you come across normocytic anemia, you then look at the what is the MCHC. If the MCHC is high, it indicates mostly you are dealing with the hereditary spherocytosis and particularly in the sickle cell belt, it can be sickle cell anemia. So, these are the ways and particularly you should along after interpreting like this, you should confirm with the peripheral smear. Peripheral smear is a very valuable tool and valuable addition to CBC with respect to hematological issues. When a patient presents with bleeding or super skin and superficial bleeding, when there is a platelet count is very low, when other cell lines are completely normal, it indicates mostly you are dealing with a case of ITP. If other cell lines are abnormal, it indicates mostly you are dealing with the sinister causes like aplastic anemia or a leukemia. So, after hematological indications, now let us see how it is useful in the field of immunology. Particularly when you are come across such a family with a history of recurrent early infant deaths, when the cord blood shows absolute lymphocyte count is less than 2 to 3000, it indicates mostly you are dealing with a severe combined immunodeficiency. In the same way, early infants with infections with abnormal neutrophilic response in the form of 30,000, 40,000 high neutrophilia, you should always suspect leukocyte addition deficiency or a chronic granulomatous disease. And in the same way, when there are recurrent infections with the recurrent skin infections and eczema, you should always think about when there is associated eosinophilia, you should think about Job syndrome or hyper Ig syndrome. These are the ways it is useful in the field of immunology. Now, let us see how it is useful in the field of rheumatology. In a rheumatological patient, particularly when there are features of SOJRA, when there is associated neutrophilic leukocytosis with the thrombocytosis with the markedly raised ESR, it can be a feature of SOJRA. Or even vasculitis like conditions, when there are multi system involvement, like a Kawasaki disease or a polyarthritis nodosa or a Takayasu arthritis, there will be again the same response that is neutrophilic leukocytosis with the thrombocytosis and high ESR. And in an adolescent female, when you come across with the fever, prolonged fever, with vague aches and pains, when you do the CBC, which when it shows leukopenia with the lymphopenia, with the thrombocytopenia, you can easily suspect that you are dealing with the case of systemic lupus erythematosus. This is the way it is useful in rheumatology. Friends, so far I had given the bird's eye view of indications and interpretation of CBC in various settings. Finally, the carrier messages are, Number one, with respect to primary hematological issues in the form of pallor and bleeding, the utility of CBC is phenomenal along with the peripheral smear study. Number two, neutrophilic leukocytosis is not always equal to serious bacterial infection. Number three, with respect to diagnosis and monitoring of a dengue patient, the utility of CBC is very good. Number four, with respect to other day-to-day -day infections, CBC serves as a starting point and gives direction to which specific investigation you have to go about. For example, in a patient with a 4 to 5 days of fever with the leukopenia and eosinopenia, you know you have to go for blood culture. So, now friends, you would have understood what are the indications and interpretation with respect to CBC. Thank you.